Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm joined by my friends and colleagues from Garden Organic, Chris Collins and Anton Rosenfeld. This month we've got a lot to discuss. Are you finding your soil is very dry? Chris and I discuss watering tips. We also look at the common pests you might be encountering, from aphids to carrot fly, and we discuss the organic approach on how to manage them. Our post bag has a colourful mix of questions. Should you pinch out your tomatoes? Cover your beds in coffee grounds? And, as one listener asks, is it okay to empty the washing up water onto your precious plants? As always, we're grateful to our sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. Chris and I love this website as you can get everything you need to help you with your organic growing. Just click on www.organiccatalogue.com and if you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. I think you'll enjoy our guest interview this month. I had the pleasure of chatting with popular garden designer Jack Wallington, who loves his weeds so much he's written a book about them. You'll hear that once again we've had to record our chats remotely. I hope you can forgive the odd pop and crackle, but whether you're weeding, jogging, or settle down with a cuppa, welcome and enjoy this month's episode. Morning, Chris. Morning, Sarah. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And on this June morning, I just couldn't feel better. It's just the most beautiful month, isn't it? Yeah, it has been. Actually, the weather has, in terms of sunshine, been quite amazing, hasn't it? Through May and up to the beginning of June, quite incredible. Yeah, but... Yeah, there is always a (laughs) but. Yes, it's been very, very dry, hasn't it? It's been, it's incredible. Um, I mean, it it keeps going. I know we sound a bit like southern softies here, moaning because I know that it's concentrated in the south, particularly. It's been incredibly dry. I think we've had one day's rain since the beginning of April, really up to the end of May. It still looks sunny now. I'm incredibly busy on watering duty. I don't know about you, Sarah. A huge amount of watering. I know you are a morning waterer. I'm an evening waterer because we both recognise there's no point in doing it in the middle of the day when it's just going, you're going to get transpiration. The water's just going to burn off in the sun or the wind or whatever. But yes, you need to do it either early morning or in the evening. And the other thing, Chris, is mulching. Now, I know this is a word that we use often, and it's basically saying putting down a layer of organic material. It can be compost, lawn cuttings, it can be straw, something that's going to cover the soil after you've watered. Because what that's going to do is it's going to hold the water down, the moisture down into the soil. It says exactly what you just said. It will reduce transpiration. It will stop that sun sucking the moisture back out of the ground. And also, you've got to remember, a lot of the roots that absorb the water are near the surface. So you want to keep the moisture in around those roots and make sure they're drinking OK. Um, and also the other things it does as well. You know, mulching is a multi beneficial thing of p- pulling out the weeds. I am weeding still like on my allotment like you never knew. They don't mind if it's dry. And so being able to put a mulch down makes my weeding duties a lot easier. Because it's suppressing the weeds, isn't it? They don't get the light and they, therefore they don't thrive so True. well. And also if they do battle through it, they're just much easier to remove because they've not got grip into that dry soil. You see, they just come out. They're much more easy, especially the annuals much more easy just to tease out or run a hoe through so basically the mantra is weed water yeah. mulch exactly yeah i think another little tip as well is quite good is i puddle as well so the plants that are now going to put on a lot of growth like say the courgette um the runner bean my tommies i will actually put a layer like a ridge of soil around them so i can puddle and we talk about deep watering this is a great way to do it so you know you've put, applied quite a lot of water if you put that uh, puddle in that you raise a bit of ridge maybe say 20 centimeters around the base of the plant and then you can fill that right up with water and that will soak right down into the roots and then you can get your mulch on yeah i think that's so important don't do little scatterings of watering around and water the soil not the plant I yes think is also important Brilliant. it's a great tip early morning or late evening when it's nice and cool water deep of course you know you may we may well have a very wet june <laughs> we do. I, I would not complain because I'm spending like literally two hours a day watering at the moment. And everybody is. And it's funny, my allotment site, which is huge, all runs off one mains. So everybody's watering and the pressure's so low. So you kind of like water is a big commodity at the moment. So what will be one? If it pours down for a week in June, I will not be complaining about well, it. Well, it'll fill all the rain butts, won't it? And your yes, buckets exactly. and everything else <laughs> that you're trying to capture it in. Um 
Watering is quite key when you're sowing. Now, I'm mentioning sowing because a lot of people think that you sow seeds in spring and they should be growing by now, which, of course, they are. But, of course, you can sow in the summer and you should be sowing in the summer months. It's not too late for beans, courgettes and herbs. And it's also important to have what we call successional sowing. In other words, if you've sown your lettuces early on, you're going to get a glut of lettuces within a month or six weeks, and then you need to have more for later. So why not sow them in succession? So if you sow every two or three weeks, you'll get a nice sequence of lettuces to eat. Isn't that right, Chris? That's absolutely right. And uh, what I tend to do is I intersow. So if I've got two lines of, uh, say, spinach and some lettuce and some cut again salad, I will sow in between those rows as I start to crop so it becomes perpetual. And you're right, it's no time to stop sowing. I have brassicas I've just put in, actually. I've put some brassicas in. Um, I've just sowed. Do you want any basil? I've got about 5,000 basil plants because I, oh, <laughs> <That's a problem. laughs> I always get carrot. I always sow more than I need. It's a bad habit of mine but we end up giving them away so it won't be a bad thing but yeah bat herbs basil coriander parsley i've sowed brilliant experiences in gardening isn't it it's to see new seedlings coming up and if you yeah. can benefit from that on your allotment site or in your raised beds where you're growing food even better yeah and also if you're like me you were caught out by the late frost in may come on hands up listeners who else was <laughs> caught out <laughs> a lot will it's, it's interesting i've read a lot of stuff about hardening off get a lot of sort of dodgy information i think and uh and I think like this whole the hokey cokey game of putting stuff in and putting it out, I, I'll give a simple solution to it really is um, just get some cold frames. That's how we used to use on the parks, the botanic gardens. Because what you do then is you're growing in your greenhouse, you get the plants up and running, you ventilate your greenhouse. Then when it comes to the end of May, early June, put them in a cold frame and obviously you lift the lights for the day, all the panes of glass come up for the day, let the air in. And if you think it's going to be a cold night, you shut the cold frame. So it just makes it a little bit simpler, less labour intensive if you like. But I didn't do that, Chris, and I'm ashamed <laughs> to admit it, which is Listen. why it's not too late. And I'm sowing beans even now in June. I'm putting in some beans Listen. and I know I'll get beans by autumn easily. Of course you will. They soon get a wriggle on their fast moving plants and all gardeners, whether they've been doing it a year or 50 years, will get caught out by a late frost now and again. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. I feel a little better now. <laughs> Um, there's plenty of information on what to sow and what to plant out on the Garden Organic website. If you just click on the gardening advice tab and go into the month by month section, you'll see what you can sow and plant out in June this month. Um, and while we're in the veg patch, Chris, let's have a look at some of the most active pests and diseases this month. I mean, there's so much young green growth and the air is warm and with your watering, you're providing moisture. It's no wonder that the bugs are thriving. So first off, let's look at aphids. I'm guessing you've got a few on your balcony oh. and on your allotment. Oh, you wouldn't believe the black aphid infestation. I've just literally the last couple of weeks on my broad beans, which are all beautiful. I ate some last night. They're wonderful. But it's just absolutely covered in them suddenly they obviously the time's right and they're all out there asexually reproducing which means one aphid can just pump out babies so they're content you know it's really <laughs> quite they are on mass but 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 i went down there yesterday and the whole of the crop is now covered in ladybirds so I am thinking I'm, re I'm really, really looking forward to seeing how much devastation they can reap on those aphids in the next couple of weeks. Well, what you've actually illustrated is a very good organic principle, which is if you have a pest, there is almost bound to be some sort of predator that will come along and help you. And by predator, I don't mean a wild animal <laughs> like a lion or a tiger. <laughs> Something as simple as a ladybird or a hoverfly or even a, a little sparrow or a great tit will eat those aphids for you. So don't panic if your plants are covered in aphids. And Wait think, for the predator to come along. Sorry, I interrupted you there, Sarah. Yeah, I think that um, also maybe plant and encourage those things as well. So like fennel, put fennel in and let it flower. Hoverflies everywhere. I did that on the balcony too. So you can think about the plants that are going to encourage those predators in. And also you get a more balanced site because obviously you've not got the same, too much of the same plant growing. You've got a right mix and that will help organically too. Yeah, that's a very good principle, Chris. If your plants are heavily infested and the aphids, they're sap sucking insects, they'll be taking the goodness from the young growth. Pick off the heavily infested shoots, and I suspect you might have done that on your broad beans, um, and drop them into a bucket of soapy water. That will drown the aphids. Alternatively, a strong jet of water can also dislodge the aphids. Just water. You don't need anything more noxious than that. And just squirt at them and the aphids will come flying off. 
I think um, all talking about making a little errors, I suppose, is I think I pinched my tips out on the broad beans a bit late, and that's why I've got such a heavy infestation. It's quite important maybe to get those uh, tips pinched out earlier on in the game, just to reduce the amount of aphids you're getting. And the ladybirds will sort it out, but those two combinations, pinching and let, get the ladybirds in, should control the pest. And I'll tell you something, the tips of those broad bean plants are delicious, oh, delicious. in a stir fry. Yeah, they are. They, <laughs> they taste like almost pea, pea-like, don't they? They're quite mm. quite incredible. A lot, it's quite a good secret, that, I think, because I was telling them, even a few of the old boys on my site didn't know that, so I was feeling quite proud of myself. Ah. OK, so the next thing that's going to blitz you in your, your veg patch, I'm guessing, is the lovely little cabbage white butterfly. Looks so adorable as it's fluttering around, but actually it's lethal because it's going to lay its eggs on the underside of your brassica leaves. And soon you're going to have a lot of very hungry caterpillars, which are going to strip your cabbage and broccoli leaves. So if you haven't already, keep that butterfly out by netting your brassicas. I use a fine mesh, not a fleece, which can trap the warm air around the plant, and that's a recipe for diseases, but a fine mesh or a very fine net, pin it firmly all around the plants and particularly down at soil level. Yeah, I've just done that literally um, a couple of days ago, and it, it's very, very effective. Like you say, you've got to... I mean, I remember doing it a few years ago and you leave any sort of gaps or little two inch gaps, they'll be in there, won't they, straight yeah. away. So making sure the net is contacted with the soil is very essential. But I just think, you know, for a few bob, a, a good brassica net is well worth the investment. Yeah. I'd say, and that means, obviously, you're not using any chemicals, anything artificial. It's just a net. So all your produce underneath that net is going to be lovely and organic. So true. And Chris, do you grow carrots? Are you troubled by carrot fly at all? I do grow carrots. I grow a lot of carrots. And I don't, it's, it's interesting you mention it because on my last allotment site, I lived over in Finchley, you couldn't, couldn't grow them unless they were in a container. It was so riddled with carrot fly. I don't seem to have the same problem on this allotment site, but I am very meticulous. That if I thin them out, I'm very careful about not leaving any foliage lying by the side or any kind of smell coming off them because obviously they release a pheromone that attracts the, the carrot fly in. But if you are having masses of problems, do what I did on the last um, places. You have to grow them in containers. There's a lovely little one called Globe, which you can grow in a nice big pot, and they are absolutely delicious. And the secret of growing in con containers is that you can put the container up high because a little known fact about the carrot fly is it's not very good at flying. <laughs> so if you can actually raise your container up on, say, onto a table or a potting bench or whatever, the chances are the carrot fly can't get up to it. And in a similar way, if your carrots are in the ground, try putting up a barrier, a, again, of mesh will stop the fly being able to fly over the top. It need only be a metre high maximum. And that's also been proven to work. Yeah, they, they get a uh, height sickness, don't they, carrot fly? A very peculiar fly for them. They get height sickness, isn't it? <laughs> but those, are, but those, are, yeah, those, those tips are brilliant. Well, the Victorians came up with this. They used to grow a lot of big pots of carrots in greenhouses and stuff, actually, in cold frames as well there is some evidence that growing carrots with onions can help but with all the research that we've done at garden organic over the years we found that actually you need at least four rows of onions to one of carrots yeah and that's quite a lot of onions and also <laughs> once the onion leaves begin to die down or begin to flatten out they cease to be so effective so it's a mixture, I'm guessing, of the height as well as the, the smell of the bruised foliage. Yes, that's exactly, yeah. Now, something I'm going to be looking out for, Chris, because I grow a lot of chard and spinach, is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is a very common disease, especially in dry weather. It can be specific to certain sorts of plants. And the one for chard and spinach, it's a grey powdery coating on the leaves and it almost always appears in hot, dry weather. So the secret to this is to keep on top of your watering. I like your idea of puddling, Chris. But again, back to the organic principle of making sure that your soil is in good enough condition to hold the moisture, to hold the water. And to do that, you need to put in plenty of homemade compost, something that will bulk up the soil to keep the moisture within it. Yeah, that's brilliant advice. And I, the other thing also is just making sure you do your DDD rule, I think. I've got a little bit on my strawberries, a bit of triads on strawberries, just picking them over. As soon as you see it, remove the disease leaves, take them away, and just make sure that you don't let it spread into the rest of the plant. So a little bit of observational work as well. Yeah, it's keeping the growing area healthy, isn't it? And that's such a fundamental part of prevention of disease. Again, the organic principle that you prevent rather than treat. Yeah. 
And of course, there's plenty on the Garden Organic website on pests and diseases. Again, you just have to go to www.gardenorganic.org.uk. Chris, there's one thing that I'm going to discuss with you because it's close to my heart, and that's pigeon damage. Now, I have a small cherry tree and the pigeons are coming down early in the morning. They're stripping the leaves off the top of the tree, which isn't doing it any good. And in the next few weeks or so, they're going to be stripping every single one of those precious cherries off as well. Have you also got problems with pigeons where you are? On uh, you know both places, my balcony they like to come. Because obviously I feed the small birds, but they still turn up. They are a problem. They will. They they actually chewed off the base of my new parachutes. I don't wow. know why why they were doing that at all. And I've actually had some contacts on social media with people saying to me, uh, sending me photos of hostas where they've also done the same thing, where they just cut them off at the bottom. They nip them off at the bottom. They'll do the same to peas if they're allowed. And my allotment, my neighbour, Kim, she loves gooseberries and she had a massive great crop of them. I was looking at them last week and we were there yesterday and nearly all of them had gone. And not only that, a lot of the branches, the delicate branches have been broken as well. And that is pigeons flapping around in them and eating all those gooseberries. So really you've got to think about, do you think netting in that situation, Sarah? Mm, Definitely. And in fact, what I've done, which is quite (laughs) <laughs> it's quite amusing it's an old greenhouse and the glass was all broken but the frame was still fine and it's one of those sort of hexagonal ones it's not particularly big with no glass in it it's actually quite light the frame so the neighbors helped me lift this frame up and we've put it over the top of this small cherry tree and i've now wrapped the netting around the frame and it looks like something from kew gardens but it's keeping the pigeons out if you can get some sort of framework up and then netting around it, that's the only way you're going to keep the pigeons off whatever plant it is. And also, of course, pigeons are big on brassicas. They love brassicas. So getting that net down, oh, not, no. only, not only protect from cabbage, white, but also keep the pigeons off as well. To be honest with you, it's probably my main pest on the allotment. It's the thing that gives us the most grief. So you do need to bear in mind. And they just crack me up because they come to my balcony and they sit on the railings and I run out there and I go, oi, and they kind of fly two foot away and land in the tree and look at me. They're not the brightest birds in the world. <laughs> so you can't, they're quite difficult to scare, you know. <laughs> <A bit cheeky. laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, Chris, moving away from the veg patch, what are you doing with your herbaceous and your annuals and your flowering ornamentals? Well, it's funny, isn't it, how we kind of, you have a very intense period, like through April and May, I always call it, the, you really graft hard as a gardener because you're looking for those rewards further down the line. And we're just coming in the crossover period now where I'm looking at the herbaceous plants, putting on quite a lot of border, quite a lot of spring uh, flowering shrubs like Forsythia, Wygelia, Ribes have all finished. Flowers are gone, so I need to give them some attention. The basic stuff I need to stake. It's been quite windy in London uh, here and there. So you need to think about them not getting blown all over the place. So pottering around the garden, some of the jobs I'm doing is I'm cutting back my spring flowering shrub, shrubs by a quarter, say a full scythia, a quarter of the wood, so it puts on growth for next year's flower. I'll also is that, little... Sorry to interrupt you, Chris. That's is right? that all of the shoots? In some bushes, you do just a third of the shoots and leave some of them growing. On a, on a, on a full scythia, I'll take the whole shrub back, yeah, a quarter, basically. So you're almost framework pruning it in a way if you like you can leave some other growth on if you want if it's a smaller shrub but i think it also prolongs the life of the shrub if you're giving it that kind of pruning some shrubs like carrier which flower on wood that's very new you can cut that right down hard even so some plants you can even cut harder but just about making sure the plant puts on new growth for next year's flower you say you've got because it will flower on the, the growth that's put out this year the other thing I'll be doing is looking at making sure my herbaceous don't get blown everywhere. Things like phlox, or dronicums, or helianthus, macleas, big, tall flowering herbaceous plants. As I'll put some bamboo around the base of them and I'll put twine around that bamboo and I will just I'll bury it quite deep and I'll raise it up as the plant's growing. So I've protected it from any winds. If you don't want to go to all that faff, you can buy nice kits that will do that for you. So you can pull up the stakes as they grow. But that's quite important because you don't want to go all this far in and then find you have one windy night, which we have on saturday and then find you get a load of damage or heavy rain will do that won't it yes it will so you just got to make sure you've got your eye out these are what i call the pottering jobs when i'm quite in my element in the garden like deadheading roses i've got some beautiful roses going on the balcony so i'm deadheading those i like to just snip out the evergreens like shaka cocker that kind of thing to keep them producing lateral growth they're all those sort of little jobs uh, husbandry jobs if you like on plants to make sure you get a really good display out of them over the summer Something else I've been doing, and it's known as the Chelsea chop, 
is actually cutting back a flowering perennial right now here in early June so that it will then put up new shoots so it will be flowering later in the summer. Nepeta is a very good example I found to do that with. Yes, certainly. And it just means you're prolonging the, the period of flowering. You're cutting out the growth and you're getting that juvenility back. You get the hormones going and they'll flower some more. Another really good one at the moment is my hardy annuals seem to be doing well. I've had to water them a lot. I've got peas, sweet peas. I've been out and got myself some pea sticks. They look great put in the ground with the peas rambling around them. All those little attention to details to support your plants and make sure they're healthy and they really give you a good performance. Okay, Chris. So before we finish, let's just think of our top tips for the month. Have you got a couple? I have indeed. Of course, I'll start off, Sarah, with my one of my favourite edibles. It's obviously tomatoes. I do love my Tommies. I've got loads of tumbler tomatoes on the balcony at the moment. The key to success for me with them is my foliar feeds. And I obviously use comfrey. I obviously do it organically. So I've got some comfrey going on the allotment. I dilute that and I like to actually spray it on actually early in the morning with a mister. Just to give that feed. That'll make sure I've got really strong, robust plants and hopefully give me lots of those delicious cherry tomatoes later in the year. The other problem I might have a little bit with is, and we're coming back to netting again, is obviously I have a strawberry patch. The two things I do with the strawberries, one is I net them to keep the birds out, make sure it's me who gets those lovely red ripe strawberries, and I also make sure I give them a good old drink, deep drink, first thing in the morning. Sounds good, Chris. Ah, and it sounds delicious as well. Thanks, Chris. That's really helpful. Have a lovely, lovely time out on your allotment and your balcony. You too, Sarah. Take care. Speak to you soon. OK, bye. Bye. Our interview this month is with a garden designer who loves weeds. Jack Wallington has written a beautiful and practical book called Wild About Weeds, Designing with Rebel Plants, in which he argues the case for the beauty of weeds, making sure they're a plant in the right, not the wrong place. But first, I wanted to know how Jack started as a garden designer and what led him to love his rebel plants. Jack, how nice to talk to you, albeit in this rather bizarre situation that I'm at home and you're down on your allotment, I gather. (laughs) Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me on inside my shed at the moment, trying to hide from the wind. But it's sunny and it's warm and I'm looking out on my allotment, so I'm very happy. Oh, how nice. And how is the (laughs) allotment looking? It's looking good, actually. I'm I'm really happy with it this year. It's kind of, it's all coming together, actually. I've got got a set layout with most of its vegetables, but some of it's got flowers and ornamentals on, and they're, they're looking really good this year already. It's very dry. Um, mm. it's been a very dry spring but otherwise I'm, I'm really happy with it all because it's been a real particularly in this time um, it's been a real escape for me um, I think that's true for a lot of us that we're finding solace in this difficult time through gardening and growing and being in touch with nature absolutely exactly that reason just and coming down and it, everything changes whenever I come down so it really takes my mind off of, off of the um the worst side of things happening okay and um, just tell me Jack, what started you in your growing and your gardening? You are a garden designer now, but what, let's go right back to the beginning. How and why did you start as a gardener? Yeah, if we go right back, I suppose I've always been interested in plants. And so when I was a young boy, I did grow lots of things, a plant here and there, lots of cacti and carnivorous plants and the odd vegetable. But then from university onwards, I had a different career and completely forgot about it. But always had this nagging feeling that something was missing. And it wasn't until my 30, early 30s, so I started, we, we bought our, our flat, which had a small garden, um, and I started doing little bits and bobs there. And from there, everything snowballed extremely quickly, and I started planting things, became more interested, read more, started doing a course for fun, and the RHS course. Um, and that taught me so much, so I wanted to do more and more. Um, and eventually, we had, I actually took part in a, a TV show, uh, one of Monty Don's TV shows, where we did up our garden, essentially, our new garden. We'd, um, and I enjoyed that process combined with all of the, the learning that I was doing places like, oh there's a career that I could have in designing other people's gardens and helping them have what I've been able to do and so I, I, I did one for free for a, a friend um, and that went well and it just took off very quickly from there until I had oh, to how fantastic. make a choice. So yeah. it's almost like a complete life change for you a, a change in career and direction. Yeah for me it was a real epiphany um, suddenly realising that the one thing that I really loved was the one thing that had been there all through my life even on um, ah. so I feel, very, I feel very lucky to have made that switch. Yes oh that that's brilliant and tell me what do you think makes a good garden designer somebody who has that visual sense of how a garden looks or works even how a garden functions? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. It's, got, it's, got a, it's a tough one to answer, but I think for me, it's about understanding, having really good spatial awareness um, and understanding what people, how people would want to use or could use a space. 
one key thing is you have to be a really good listener um, because it's not like designing your own garden. You're designing it for other people uh, who could have very different lives to you. So um, I don't have children, but quite a lot of people I design gardens for have families and they've got young kids who want to play around. And it's um, understanding how, they, how, how that space should and could be used, and how it might evolve. But one for me, I think one thing that's absolutely key is that a designer has to a garden designer has to really understand plants and i think in the past that wasn't always emphasized as much it was more about the layout and the materials and plants were still uh, obviously really important but i think these days there's a greater understanding that you really do have to understand plants because they're almost like a con- in a way they're almost like a construction material but they change over time and so you really have to know what you're planting and what that what impact that will have on the space over many many years and how they'll interact with one another so it's um, not just a visual thing of having a dark green leaf against a pale grey one or a big plant against a small one it's more you think there's a kind of symbiosis between the plants that you're putting in i think so i think i think the visual side is so important too of course you have to know how to pair plants and make that look good but um for me i think you're i think you've hit a nail there it's, it's more about it being an experience for people and people being a part of that uh, ecosystem or at least being able to start an experience it and seeing how uh, wildlife interact and um, do you go back and visit the gardens you've designed because there is a difference isn't there between a very young new garden and one that's a good three or four years old yes yeah, so most of the gardens are quite often will still maintain the but I'll always revisit just to check up on how, how progress is doing, to offer advice. If not every plant's going to work. In, in reality, these are living things. So actually, with the best will in the world, you might plant an amazing plant planting scheme. But one plant may just may not like it. And so you have to then a year later twist it or add something else or something may really love it and be taking over and you have to take that plant out. Um, so that adjustment is ongoing. And for you, Jack, how important is organic growing and organic gardening? Um, for me, it's, it's essential. I'm, I'm an organic gardener at home and on my allotment and even in my, my garden. So um, I don't have any licenses for spraying chemicals. So I just don't I won't use them. I won't preach it to people. I think it's up to people to make up their own minds. But I will educate clients. I find on the whole they want they're eager to learn how to do it. They, they, they think it might be quite hard to be organic in the garden. But actually, once they start to understand the tricks and tips, they start to they, they really enjoy learning that actually. And it's understanding the interdependencies, isn't it, between the ecosystems, whether it's the soil life, the plant life, the insect life, whatever it might be. It's that interdependency of it all that I always think is so fascinating about organic growing. I think that's at the heart of it where it's um, once you start to understand how it all connects together it's like magic. <laughs> it's like when uh, this plant that you could put into the ground thinking about its roots could be feeding soil organisms or its, its leaves as they slowly decay and, and worms eat them and then you've got bees and butterflies and hoverflies all feeding off of the flowers and I think what, one thing I'm really, I'm really fascinated in aphids at the moment because over the last few years in my garden um, I've just noticed that we have loads of aphids at the start of the spring yeah. um, and then at this point suddenly we've got barely any because um the little troops of the, the hoverfly and the ladybird larvae are all out there on mass yeah. and and if you kill the aphids then you take away the food for those and so it's kind of this wonderful cycle really yes and it's persuading people to hold their nerve if they see the aphid yes. don't panic don't blitz it leave it there and then the predator will come along and deal with it but i always think also with organic gardening once you understand that link that chain then you genuinely don't even want to introduce something that's going to poison it or disrupt it you actually want to encourage that chain and strengthen it I, yeah i agree with you and certainly in my own garden I'll, i'm really reluctant now to buy plants in if I, I tend to grow most stuff from seed or i'll buy them from specialists where i know that they haven't used chemicals well jack our theme this month is inevitably is weeds because it's a month when we're all trying to keep on top of weeds which may be taking the goodness and the moisture from the ground where our chosen plants are growing and I'm sure you've heard this phrase before that people say well if only my plants would grow as well as the weeds but you are something of a specialist in weeds you've written the book wild about weeds and you incorporate weeds in your garden designs tell me a little bit more about your thoughts about how the gardener can use weeds or enjoy weeds in their growing space <laughs> yeah, so i think people are going to think i'm completely mad at first possibly um but over the years i've noticed that weeds or they're just plants and they behave in different ways depending on the conditions that they're in and i found that some weeds that every gardener i spoke to would say are the bane of their life and terrible and you must remove it and i found something like um purple log salis um creeping sorrel it's everywhere on my allotment and if i tried to get rid of it it would be an impossible task 
mask and actually it wasn't harming anything at all it's so small it just kind of creeps around so yes i started looking at these different plants and thinking actually some of them are quite pretty um and if perhaps they could be bringing color into our gardens and so yeah i've been introducing them into in or leaving them in um some garden designs so not not going completely crazy with them and uh, perhaps in every garden there's probably one weed which is naturally growing there and it's found its way into that spot and i'll uh, or incorporate it into the designs so when i go around to survey or appraise the garden in the first instance i'll see what's already growing um and if one thing is there i'll i might say that as inspiration or um include that in the, the planting palette from the off an example that. of where you might see that would it be something like cow parsley or buglia yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> cow parsley is definitely a good one and um, things like it kind of crosses over into wildflowers well like, yes what is the difference between a weed and a wildflower jack <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think there is none a weed is a wildflower a wildflower can become a weed um, and the same is true of ornamentals it's, it's quite interesting that there's no real or no no true definition of exactly what categories plants fall into so um, for instance an oxide daisy is one person's wildflower to another person it's a weed which just keeps coming back in their borders and they want to get rid of it and so there's a real crossover and it really comes down to what each individual's perception is for instance one of my clients I was speaking to you was saying they cannot get the yellow Welsh poppy to grow in their garden. They use seed every year. They try plugs and everything. They cannot get it to grow. Uh, so to them, it's a desired ornamental wildflower. Um, but I had another client who we were talking and he's saying, you can plant anything you want in my garden. But the one thing I want gone is that yellow weed, which has come up <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> and, to, the kind of, and so I was having these conversations and thinking, hang on a second. <laughs> it's like, it, it just comes down to what people like and, and understanding how the plants grow and what conditions they like, essentially. Mm. Um, and weeds are good indicators, aren't they, of the sort of soil you've got and the sort of conditions that you're growing in? Yeah, they are. If, if a weed's growing, it's happy where it is. And so certainly things like um, a stinging nettle loves to have rich, moisture-retentive soil. So if you've got stinging nettles, you might be disheartened, but actually don't be because it's a real indicator that you've got really good soil. Another thing I quite liked in your book was how you talk about if you can identify whether we call it a weed or a wildflower, sometimes just by eliminating all the others all around it, so you have just one example of it, it becomes a very beautiful plant. I'm thinking of, is it purple loose strife? It's one of the ones yeah. which you say you've incorporated and and it's quite eye-catching when it grows on its own. Yeah, and I think that's, that's where I started really, was just looking at these plants and it, that no plant is going to look good growing out of a crack in a pavement with rubbish all around it. <laughs> um, mm. But then if you if you remove that and just look at the plant itself and then reappraise it, um, quite a few of these plants have quite an attractive form and it might be quite colourful. So you have purple loose strife. And in fact, mm. it, it can be quite weedy in damp areas, but if you're growing in a drier area, the weediness stops because it, it doesn't have, it, you're starting to restrict conditions that it likes so if you have a slightly drier area that will help stop it from spreading whereas purple toad flax which is a smaller purple spire it was an ornamental plant which escaped and has now become weedy <laughs> would love drier conditions and it will slowly gently seed around but it's got beautiful foliage beautiful flowers which is why uh, back in the day planted it in the gardens in the first place but things like um euphorbia virus the caper spurge yes uh, which i have a, a lot of yes and i found that um lots of people don't like it and i can understand why because it's got a it's got an architectural plant with these in the first years by annual it has this crisscross leafing structure which actually I, I stopped to look at it and thought that is quite jarring in certain situations but in a tropical garden or an urban garden that architectural shape is quite appealing and then in the second year it has this tremendous explosion of the euphorbia acid yellow flowers which goes really well with bold pinks and, uh, and other colours and uh, cooler greens and whites as well so it's in a tropical foliage garden it looks perfect actually I, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, I so think your garden designer uh, skills came out in the sentence you used where you're saying a, a border is like a tasty salad bowl it's a, a, a mixture of different textures and colours. Yeah, I think that's um, this is to me a key, key going forward. So we're talking about what makes a garden desire. I think going forward, there's more desire for people to have um, more dynamic wild life type style plantings. Um, and what what that means is allowing uh, relaxing the reins a little bit so that that tasty salad element was more don't worry so much about the exact positioning of a plant um, and want it to stay exactly where it is some of them will self-seed some will spread and that's okay because you've chosen or you've selected the colors and forms that you want and if they move around it doesn't matter so it's like a salad really you kind of you choose the ingredients you put them in a bowl and you uh, mix it around 
but you don't choose exactly where the leaves go, but somehow it still looks quite nice because you've chosen the components to go into it. That's a really nice analogy. Let's get practical, Jack, because I can imagine anyone listening to this thinking, well, I don't want a whole load of weeds in my bed. I, I take I get the point that you're you're separating them out and you're treating them as individual plants, just like any other plant in the bed. But what I loved about your book was that you then got into the practical advice of weeds for every situation, every growing situation. So you were recommending weeds for a moist garden or for dry soil or even weeds for hard surfaces. That, I have to say, actually made me laugh because we get more inquiries than anything else on people saying, how do I deal with weeds on my patios if I can't spray them? Beautiful. Let them grow. (laughs) Yeah, well, yes, it is very tempting to say that. And and the birds and the bees and the butterflies will love you for it. Give me some examples. For instance, if I had an area that was dry and shady, what would you encourage me to grow there? Mm, dry and shady. So I think um, things like euphorbia and the virus, that's caper spurge, would, would be perfect. Other things are, so ivy is, is a really divisive plant. Some people love it and some people hate it. One of the ways to grow it without it becoming, people worry about it ca- crawling up walls and affecting mortar, um, which in a way in itself is a bit of a myth because it only really damages walls that are already damaged in some way. But if you, if you grow it as a ground cover, there is no better ground cover for dry shade than, than ivy. Mm. Um, I was just going to one, one other example. One plant I absolutely love is the, the white dead nettle. It, to me, is like a, a monada, um, which we grow in ornamental situations, um, but fantastic for dry, dryish um, but shady spots. And it has these bright white flowers all summer long, almost all through the year, uh, which bees absolutely love. So again, for me, it's how, that white is quite a bright speck of colour. So when we're looking at weeds for every situation, here's another one, Jack. What about steps and walls? Uh, so I'm really interested, particularly in cities, I'm really interested in this, cities and towns, because there's a group of plants which grow on walls and we kind of walk past them. But I've noticed that the more I looked at them, the more beautiful they became. <laughs> uh, so there's the classic example of a ridgeron, um, that, the white Mexican fleabane daisy, which grows in uh, steps and is quite often seen at uh, famous gardens like Great Dickster and Kent. But there are many more like yellow corridalis and ivy leaf toad flax. And I think um, ivy leaf toad flax to me is the new Ridgeron, <laughs> because mm-hmm. I think it's it's um it's got this lovely soft habit that kind of creeps around, but somehow manages to miraculously grow in a in a wall or in cracks of steps without any seeming seemingly no growing media and hardly any water. And then there's the, the bellflowers as well. There's two different Campanula bellflowers, which one of them's trailing and one of them's a bit more of a clump former, which equally grow in walls. And I, I think they're just they're incredibly pretty. Um, some of them started as garden plants and spread out, but in in, in urban areas in particular, they're real. They are really quite prolific weeds, but so colourful. I, re- I really love those, and I think they're I th- they're really interesting. I think also what you touch on there it strikes a chord with me is how miraculous they are. As you say, they grow in the most hostile situation with no soil, no moisture. And yet these stunning plants thrive. Yeah, and it's, it comes back to where they've come from. Lots of those plants have evolved as alpine plants where they grow in rocks and, and, and shale in shale and um, where they get very little moisture but lots and lots of sun so when they got moved to the uk for instance they suddenly were like ah this this crack in this wall is like home <laughs> these plants actually have tiny root systems and they're really easy to remove and so it doesn't take two minutes to quickly nip around and pull them out they're not like a dandelion between slabs in the patio uh, so i think that, that coming back to that message that if it's not necessarily about having a weedy messy place it's about understanding the plants and knowing how to remove them as well and these and of course the other thing jack is the the great thing about growing weeds is it it's a very sustainable way of growing, isn't it? Weeds don't need expensive fertilizers, for instance. They don't need for you to change the soil pH to make it more tolerant of them. No, I think mean, this, this is a bit for me. This is one of the big wins: is that a, a weed costs nothing. It will appear by itself, and it will grow exactly where it wants to grow. It needs no watering, <laughs> or it might do it in, except in extreme summer drought. Uh, it needs no fertilizer, and it will, most of them will flower for huge chunks of time. Um, so something like uh, Herb Robert, for instance, which does like dry shade. One one client was pointing at a, a patch in their garden going, nothing will grow in this dry shady spot. And where they were pointing was a huge patch of glowing green, soft leaves with pink flowers of Herb Robert. And I was thinking, hang on, <laughs> we, we, we're going to remove that and replace it with something else. But actually, it looks quite attractive. Um, we're just blinded by the fact it's called a weed. And also they're part of that integral part of the garden and the growing area. They, they help the other wildlife in the garden, whether it's soil life, bees, butterflies you mentioned that by the white dead nettle which is loved by bees but think of dandelions 
which flower early in the year. And it's very important for those emerging pollinators to access the nectar from them. Yeah, absolutely. Things like daisies, the common daisy and lawns, which people don't want, but actually I think that's beautiful. One of my, my favourite memories as a child is picking daisies from the lawn. Uh, yeah, and then it, having that there is it's kind of like a, um, a backup snack for insects. If the other flowers aren't around for whatever reason, throughout times of the year, that's where these these plants come in handy and weeds are also can has traditionally been used as, as herbs haven't they yeah they have yeah things like um i mean there's dandelion and burdock which is the a, a classic example where um the roots become a drink which you either love <laughs> it's a bit like marmite i love it it tastes a bit like medicine but it's quite sweet um but then also the common stinging nettle makes a fantastic nutrient rich tea and um, we talk a lot about using it to make a, a fertilizer for plants but it can be good for us as well yeah did you know that, that the seeds of the stinging nettle are used in herbal medicine to act as a an energy giver a pick-me-up you know come this autumn you're going to see me full of energy <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah you'll be eating um the steam nettle seeds <laughs> I've been down in the steam nettle <laughs> if you have too much energy then i have been told that um, the common mallow if you use the petals as a, as a tea infusion it can calm you down so if you've had too many singing nettle seeds you can balance that out <laughs> petals <laughs> We have fun down here in the country, I tell you, up and down like yo-yos. <laughs> Another thing that I did like in your book, Jack, was your classification of weeds. And this made me laugh. You call them the good, the bad and the indifferent. Tell me a little bit more about that. What are the good weeds, for starters? <laughs> this, all, this all comes back to this scale that's going on in my head. And I think other people have it as well, between what's a, a wildflower and an ornamental. And then at the other end, what's a really annoying, awful weed that you want to get rid of? So at one end, uh, the bad is things like Japanese knotweed is the, is the worst offender. Um, but also things like green alkanet, bindweed, the things that are too hard to control to make it worthwhile growing and, uh, and to me you you may think other people may think differently um, but i don't think they bring enough ornamental value to warrant the amount of maintenance they would require to grow them uh, and then the, the indifferent which is at the heart of wild about weeds really are the plants that have been categorized or lumped in the weed category but i think should probably be edging a bit more towards the wildflower and ornamental end Give of the me spectrum an example. um i think a good example is it talks about her her robert and um purple oxalis are lumped in the the weedy category and i can understand why because they do spread around quite rapidly but if you stop to look at them um individually as a plant and forget about all of that stuff that we're told about them they're actually quite beautiful um with nice foliage and nice flowers mm. um whereas things like um red valerian which uh, red valerian and purple toad flax which were grown as ornamental plants originally and brought into our gardens but then over the years have begun spreading and spread too quickly and a lot of people consider them to be weeds um so again it's, it's interesting where they sit and to confuse things more plants will behave differently in different conditions so um in the south of england plants which like hotter uh, drier conditions might be more prevalent than um something up uh, in the, the north of england or in scotland one interesting example is fennel uh, where in the uk it's grown as an ornamental or a herb um, to eat but actually on the, the southern end of europe it's an incredibly invasive plant where it grows on mass and it's, uh, it's a real problem and actually i've noticed in gardens in southern england as the climate warms it's starting to replicate that so I've, I've actually included a warning in my book which might surprise a lot of people but i just i would just say keep your eye on plants like that because as the temperature rises um in the, the british climate i think plants that are a problem slightly further south in Europe will become a problem here too. Yes, that's so true. And I have uh, quite light, dry Cotswold brush soil and fennel is all over the place. I love it because it brings the hoverfly in. They love the yellow flowers of it. But you're right. I pull up as many as I keep. And your yeah. good weeds, I have to say, I don't I certainly don't think of them as weeds. Things like snapdragon, foxglove, primrose, forget me not. To me, they're an integral part of my garden. You know, I didn't admittedly I didn't invite them in, but they're there and I love them. To me, they, they probably are weeds either but what i noticed is that they behave a bit like um so actually i guess i just felt like it was unfair that, that these plants are like snapdragon and even cow parsley perhaps are, are considered wildflowers and acceptable it's just being selective isn't it yes yeah to me that was fun it's going out there and rather than putting out a little seedlings it's like, oh that shouldn't be there it's just letting it grow and seeing what it becomes and you might like it and you might not if you don't put it out later. But it, rather than putting it out earlier, you, because you might have missed something. You could have missed the best flower that was about to appear in, appear in your garden. Jack, it's been such a delight talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with us on your busy allotment afternoon. Oh, no, thank you for having me. It's been great. Bye. It's now time to open the podcast post bag. 
Hannah can't be with us this morning, so it's my turn to read out the emails. Chris and I are joined by our colleague, Dr. Anton Rosenfeld. Hello, both of you. Hello. Hi, Anton. Hi, Sarah. OK, let's dive into the very first question. I've recently planted out my tomato plants, but I'm not sure which is the best way to train them. Should I be pinching out the side shoots or just letting them get on with it naturally? Anton, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it does depend a little bit on the variety and it also depends on your situation as well. Um, Some varieties are much better grown as what are called cordon varieties. They are ones which you train up a large pole or some strings and they're perhaps more commonly grown in glass houses. And there are a lot of other varieties which are known as bush varieties and they are perhaps more suitable for a container or a patio or a hanging basket. The cordon varieties are the ones which you need to pinch out the side shoots. Um, You tend to get a smaller number, but the larger fruits from those ones. You need to pinch out side shoots which are growing in the armpits of the leaves. And then once you get to about seven or eight tiers of fruit, you need to pinch out the top as well. Otherwise, you'll just end up with sort of endless fruit production and the ones lower down won't ripen. Chris, are you a cordon or a bush variety? Well, I grow all mine, all my tomatoes, I must admit, in hanging baskets. And I usually grow tumbler. I will grow some Gardens Delight maybe in a tub as well. Um, I get a tremendous amount from them, usually, especially on the balcony because I'm south facing. It's very warm and I, I don't really have to play with them much. I'll, I'll grow them from seed. And once they're in the baskets, I'll pr- pretty much leave them to it. I might pinch or thin them out a little bit to stop the botrytis to get the air around, around them. But pretty much from July on, I've got a constant supply of tomatoes. And I, I quite like them, too, because if you get grow the bigger tomatoes, if you haven't got a greenhouse like me, or what tends to happen is you, if the weather's cool, they just sit green. They don't ever seem to ripen up, especially the big beef varieties. So I really, with the small sort of cherry tomatoes in a basket, I'm guaranteed loads of beautiful tomatoes from July till the autumn. And I kind of think it's important to say that when it does, does come to tomatoes, a lot of the ones we buy from the supermarket are coming from abroad and produced hydroponically. And the difference in taste between one off your own plant and one off uh, from a supermarket is quite, quite palpable. So I think whether you're a bit more expert and you want to grow them in a cordon or just have a hanging basket full of them, it's really worth the effort. Is it right, Anton, that you can almost make a choice on this matter? I grow Gardener's Delight, for instance. It's a very popular variety of tomato. And I know that I could pinch out the side shoots and it would grow as a cordon or I could just leave them and I will get more but smaller fruit. It is true to some extent, although some varieties do seem to lend themselves better to being cordons and others better to being being as bushes. But there are some like Roma or Coralic or Gardener's Delight you can do either with as well. So there are some which sort of swing both ways. That's great. Thank you. All right, we have another email here, and I think this is very pertinent because Chris and I have been talking a lot about watering. The listener asks, is it okay to use my washing up water for watering? Chris, what are your thoughts? So I've not been big on using washing up water, to be honest with you, but I did have a bath on Monday and there was literally, you could have grown tatties in it because I'd been on the allotment all day and a lot of stuff came off me, but obviously I used a lot of soap. Originally, I might have taken that a few years ago and put that on a shrub or a tree or used it like that. But it'd be interesting to see whether I was doing the right thing, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's one of those things that's like the water. It's a slightly grey area. We don't really want to be putting lots of soap or detergents into the soil. What a soap or a detergent does is it removes oils from things. That's what it's doing. It's removing the grease from your body or from your from your dinner plates. And and it does the same when it gets into the soil. It removes the sort of fatty coating around any of the sort of biological life in there. So it's not doing your biological life that much good. Um, Perhaps the occasional use might be okay, but you certainly wouldn't want to be doing it on a regular basis. So basically, then it interferes with the the, the soil, It interferes with the life of the soil. And so that's probably a way to be cautious with it. It certainly certainly does. And the other thing that people might get worried about is the danger of Legionnaire's disease as well, Um, especially if water is going to be stored for any time. You don't want to be storing it for more than 24 hours. And is it all right to use on the veg patch, on salad plants and things, Anton? 
I certainly would avoid anything edible. I'd be using it just on non-edible sort of ornamentals or sort of shrubs and things. Given that water will become and is an issue in the south and southeast of the country, I think we should all be mindful about how much water we use and how much mains water we use. And therefore using grey water, recycled water can be a good thing. I, for one, if I'm washing up by hand, I always have a second bucket in which I rinse the soapy water off. This second bucket has much clearer water in it, and that's what I tend to use out on the garden. I think being frugal with water is a must, really. I think, um, you know, you don't know. We live in quite unpredictable times when it comes to the weather, and and we need to be much more treating our water supply as an asset and not just something we take for granted, for sure. Certainly. Um, And we can think about our sort of other watering measures as well to try and conserve water. My water butt's certainly empty now, so yeah, it is a concern. Yes, thank you, Anton. Chris and I had quite a long conversation about that earlier earlier about watering deep and long and watering the soil and not the plant of course with all this we now hope that we're going to get a really wet june (laughs) (laughs) okay now we're going to move on to a listener who says that her apple leaves are curled and distorted as they first came out and they're now covered in little pink aphids She asks, what should I do about this? Anton, do you have thoughts? Well, this almost certainly sounds like a rosy apple aphid. It can be quite a problem if it's around in large numbers. Um, Not so much a problem if it's just localised on the plant. But it causes the leaves to be distorted. But the other main thing it does is it attacks the fruits just as they're forming. And you end up with very small distorted fruits. But by the time you get to that stage, it's a bit late to do much about it. The damage is already done, really. If it's early on, just as the leaves are forming, you can pick off the aphids or use a soft soap spray. Um, Longer term, you might want to be looking at using a winter wash on the trees because they overwinter in the bark of the trees. This is something really you'd only do in extreme measures if you're really regularly getting a problem and it's causing big losses. Um, Winter wash is a soft soap spray again, but it's applied um, like a sort of pump action into the crevices of the bark and it will knock out the aphids, but there are danger it might knock out some of your beneficials as well. So you want to be sort of mindful of doing that. It's so often the case, isn't it, when you're trying to deal with a pest, and especially with a spray, then the the danger is that you're going to hit other pests which aren't doing any harm, are perfectly innocent. Chris, have you used winter washes? Uh, It's interesting uh, to hear Anton say about um, there being an organic soapy deterrent to do it because I was associated with there used to be quite a lot of uh, heavy pesticide uses on winter washes in my I see it quite a lot in my early part of my career. But it's good to know that there is a deterrent that is organic. I think it's important also that probably would be a last resort, wouldn't it, Anton? You would only do it if there was a particularly nasty infestation. And I wonder if there's a light one, whether maybe the small bird life might help control it a little bit. Or is that wishful thinking? No, I think that's that's the sort of thing that would help just trying to make your environment more sort of hospitable for predators as well. So having more flowers around in things like sort of dandelions or early flowering things, really. It needs to be things which flower really early to get those predators in in sort of early in the season. I mean, things like fennel can flower pretty early in its second year. Um, it doesn't flower that early in its first year, but um, just to really bring in those predators early on. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And if you want any advice on pests and diseases such as aphids, then go to the Garden Organic website and just search for pests and diseases. OK, final last quick question. This is clearly someone who's been drinking a lot of coffee while they've been in <laughs> lockdown because they say they've got lots of leftover coffee grounds and they've heard that they're rich in nutrients. So can they be put straight on the soil? Chris, are you a coffee drinker? I am a coffee drinker. I'm uh, balancing up with lockdown with my wine drinking, so I'm doing all right. Um, the thing with it, uh, uh, with this, is I've actually never used it as a. St- you're almost talking about using it as a mulch here, aren't you? Yes, although it's interesting as to see whether they're rich in nutrients or not. Right, because I've never used thought of it as using that. I, I've only used it as a as a barrier for slugs and snails. To be honest with you, I do drink a bit of coffee. I like a fresh coffee, and uh, what I noticed, I used to put it on wet, and it used to have no effect whatsoever. But I dried it out. 
and I put it on and it was quite good as a slug and um, snail deterrent. So that's the only way I've used it. I'll be interested to see what Anton says about maybe putting it and mixing it in the compost bin because that has crossed my mind. Yeah, well, coffee grounds are, are very rich in nitrogen, so they, they're a pretty good fertiliser. But the, uh, the unwanted side effect is actually the caffeine, which can inhibit the growth of plants. It's what's called an allelopathic effect. It's what plants use to compete against each other and stop other plants growing. So really, you do need to put it in the compost heap first, and that helps the caffeine break down. Because it's sort of quite slimy and rich in nitrogen, you want to sort of balance it with other carbon-rich brown materials, so like paper or dried grass or any other sort of dried prunings to get some sort of air spaces in there. Otherwise, it can become a nasty anaerobic sludgy mess if it's just sort of composted on its own. So you you do need to mix it with an equal um, quantity of brown materials, but it's very good composted. I find it actually helps to activate my compost tea because we drink quite a lot of coffee and it helps to really get the compost going. The worms seem to really like it as well. Oh, that's really good. That's really good news, actually. I will, I'm going to use mine and my compost bin a bit more then, I think. That's great news. Great. Well, happy composting to both of you and happy drinking to both of you. And a ha- happy gardening to you too. And to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. I do hope you enjoyed this month's episode. See if you can get a copy of Jack's book. It's called Wild About Weeds, and I guarantee you'll find it an interesting read. Next month, Chris meets Jekka McVicker, the queen of herb growers. So don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss an episode. Our thanks again to the Organic Gardening Catalogue for sponsoring us and to Kevin McLeod for the music.